in a hole in the ground, there lived two geeks. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Call me Pat. Call me Greg. Welcome to episode 41 of Passion of the Geeks, the show in which two friends and fellow geeks talk about geek and pop culture and everything else we enjoy. I'm Greg. And I'm Pat. And let's get on with it. Hello, Pat. How are you doing? Hi you there, Greg. I'm doing mighty fine today. How are you? Awesome. I had a pretty good day, even though the weather is kind of bad. But as always, I'm really excited for our recording session, so... It got me through my week, yes. <laughs> I mean, you didn't have the best week, but uh, let's not talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we shall not go into this. Yeah. So let's start with some follow-up today. Yeah. Because I watched some things due to your recommendations in the last episode. Oh, great. Let me hear it. I watched some Bad Batch, oh. the new Star Wars animated show on Disney+. Plus. I watched the pilot and the first episode, and I really liked it. Oh, cool. I haven't watched too much of Clone Wars, and it picks up during the Clone Wars, obviously. But it was a really cool show. The main characters are quite good. The pilot episode, which is a double length episode, introduces those new characters really, really well. Sets mm -hmm. up some yeah cool plot lines, some cool mysteries. So I'm intrigued and I probably will watch some more episodes. Maybe when more episodes are out because if i can watch those 20 minute episodes let's say five or six in one sitting i think i might actually quite enjoy that yeah sounds like a plan i liked it somehow more than i would have thought i would because i'm really not a huge fan of the clone wars and i think they did something interesting with the material they had so um, i'm pretty intrigued how this will turn out so it's definitely worth checking out. So you, you weren't wrong about that last week. Great. The other thing I checked out is Gargoyles. Oh. I mentioned last time that, yeah, somehow Gargoyles passed me for some reason. So because it's also on Disney Plus, and no, we're not sponsored by Disney Plus, but we would <laughs> definitely take their money. I watched the first few episodes, which is the pilot called Awakening. It starts in medieval England and then second episode starts in New York. And it's quite good. After the five or six episodes that are awakening the, uh, the, the pilot, I took a break because, okay, there was enough gargles for a while, but I will definitely revisit it because the characters are interesting, the plot lines that they start, the uh, overarching plot structure is very very interesting the villain is pretty cool mm. and there's some pretty cool voices in there <laughs> yeah i'm not trying to sound too surprised that something pat is that, that something pat has recommended is actually good <laughs> but it was a lot better than i expected it to be and it was a lot better than i remembered so yeah thanks for that <laughs> i'm so glad you liked it uh um, I'm, I'm really happy yeah i mean it's not that it's my favorite show or, or anything but it's it's really really good one <laughs> thing though and i deliberately did not write that into the show notes because i wanted your live reaction i also watched the uh, ducktales reboot Oh, okay. <laughs> and you were wrong. The theme is not better than the original. <laughs> <laughs> but what about the show itself? The show itself is perfectly fine. You need a bit of time to get used to the animation style. Mm -hmm. But I was actually expecting a theme that rocked in a way. And I was really disappointed. Yeah, I mean, you're right. It, it is not 
as different as one might think. I like how the theme uh, has this kind of, um, how you, would you put it? it? It kind of grows mightier at the end there. It, it doesn't just fizzle out like the original. I like that a lot. It has more a, a bang at the end. So um, uh, I, I like that. And I like the arrangement itself. I like that a little bit more. The singer is okay. Um, I don't have any preferences there. Original Dark Tales all the way. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I have one of two, that's not too bad. <laughs> well, technically two out of three, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, moving on. So, Pat, is there anything interesting you found out today? Yeah, actually, there is something interesting. I don't know if I ever talked about Masters of the Universe. It didn't make it into a last cartoon episode because, yeah, I think the 80s original He-Man and the Masters of the Universe is a cool show and the theme is great. But I don't think that the show was, you know, that good. And honestly, I like the 2002 He-Man much more than I like the original uh, Masters of the Universe. But Kevin Smith is a huge Masters of the Universe fan. And he is working at a continuation of the original 80s cartoon with the original 80s cartoon style just brought into our current age and it's called Masters of the Universe Revelation. Now this is something that we knew for uh, quite some time but this week we got a few screenshots of how the thing will look and I actually think it doesn't look bad. It's very faithful to the original style but it also manages to look really really modern it's made by the same guys who made the castlevania netflix series and i like their style and so that that's pretty cool there is one screenshot however with tila in a sort of updated version with armor and shorter hair and this you know, that half shaven look a lot of cool girls have nowadays. I don't know if I like that. I know it's modern and everything and sort of cool, but I always thought the the combination of have be seeing Tila as that yeah, that womanly woman, but still a mighty warrior. I thought I was kind of cool. And now that she kind of looks like a warrior, um, uh, I think she lost a bit. But, I, you know, we just have some still shots, so we don't know what will happen. Uh, there are some rumors that Tila might be the main protagonist for a couple of episodes, that it's not so much about He-Man, but more of a concentration of on on the Tila character. Uh, Kevin Smith, I think, has denied that rumor. But, uh, I mean, he's well known to deny rumors that he doesn't want people to know right now, even if they turn out to be true. So, um, I mean, I'm totally okay if the focus is not on He-Man alone. I think there are enough great characters uh, so that that would be I would be totally fine with that. It's just it looks great. I I'm really looking forward to the first trailer, and they have some spectacular voice cast there with Mark Hamill and, for example, and Sarah Michelle Geller as Tila, and Kevin Conroy is also on board. And Lena Headey from uh, Game of Thrones, she, I think, plays Evelyn. So this this could be really, really interesting. And I'm really looking forward to that. 
what about you? Masters of the Universe Revelation, does it give you an itch? <laughs> I watched the show in the 80s. The theme was a little bit, was for a short while, it was on my short list for our last, uh, yeah, for our cartoon nostalgia episode. Mm. What I find more interesting is it seems to me that Netflix is trying to get revivals of old 80s animated shows on the air, maybe for the same reason that Disney makes them available as well. Mm. To have some content for that market of yeah young teens or uh, older children that they have content that is what I I assume is primarily aimed at them and maybe their dads who uh, watch it for nostalgia reason. But mm. Netflix they had a huge success with Shira. <clears throat> yeah, though I never watched that or at least until now. But um, I don't know how how good it actually was. I, I just remember when they released the first few images of it, there was this huge outcry because Shira mm. looked a little bit different. Similarly, what you described about Tila. And the show actually was really good. I, I've not watched everything, but just to, yeah, out of curiosity, I watched a few episodes. And I'm not a target audience, but it's really well made. Mm. It's really good. Uh, once you get into it, they're actually telling a pretty cool story. And I think a very inclusive story. Okay. And I actually think that, yeah, what a show like she can be and should be. And from what you're describing, what they did to Tila, maybe they're trying to do some similar things here as well. Mm -hmm. From today's standpoint, let's be honest, the original He-Man from the 80s is more than borderline sexist. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I I agree completely. And here's um, the thing: I, I'm I'm not calling you sexist or whatever, but yeah, I mean, if they <laughs> if they take the male gaze a little bit out of a children's cartoon, I'm all for it. Honestly, I don't need my cartoon characters to look hot. Sorry. <laughs> oh, well, um, I think I want my male cartoon character look at least as hot. As my female cartoon character, so I, I want, <laughs> I want both. <laughs> so, but in all seriousness, they actually found a style that, I, I mean, it really looks like the '80s cartoon, but just modern. You immediately know it's based on the '80s cartoon. It's a real perfect style, and there are screenshots with Tila in their old '80s outfit just modernized and it looks awesome. Mm. So um, I think they're doing a great job there. So I think it's some sort of character development we will see in Tila. What, what, uh, big, that's why she she will change. And, and I mean, nowadays it's kind of their, their half shave and haircut that shows a big, strong woman. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's a little bit cliched. And yeah, um, I just like uh, to be Tila with, uh, to have a Tila with, with the longer flowing hair. I just love that. But yeah, uh, and I think it the show is actually aimed at adults who kind of wish to continue watching Masters of the Universe they have watched in the 80s. So it's not primarily aimed at teenagers it's more like it's a it's a little bit like Castlevania. It's, okay. it's not n not aimed at or at children. It's it's teenagers and up. So oh, okay, um, didn't know that. There are there is another He Man reboot that will be out. It's just called Masters of the Universe, I think, and that one is in is three D animated CGI, and that one is aimed at modern children. Okay. Uh, it has a, a kind of a cool style, but yeah, this is not that. This is the Kevin Smith thing. But anyway, um, let's get over to you, Greg. Uh, how about you? Did you find out something? Well, just very briefly, some 
ja, movie business news, so to speak. AT&T is selling off Warner Brothers to Discovery, or maybe selling off is putting it wrong. They're just splitting Warner Brothers off together with Discovery and forming something new. And it seems really strange to me because it has been three years, I think, since they bought Warner Media. Mm-hmm. There was this huge, yeah, I think they even had to go before the American Congress to get permission to merge with Time Warner. And it just seems strange that with the launch of HBO Max and everything that's going on in the movie business that they decide to yeah, get rid of it in a way. Not sure what it means for DC movies, what it means for HBO Max and yeah, all their other properties. It just looks to me like the movie business in a is in a big shake up at the moment and with all the streaming services they don't really know what to do and where to make money and how to make money. When it seems that AT&T maybe realized that the content creation business and I don't like the word content in this context is not their strong suit, I don't know. I'm just looking forward to what John Oliver has to say about how business daddy got rid of him (laughs) but yeah maybe let's talk about that uh, in another episode and the other news that's not connected to this but in the same ballpark is apparently amazon is in the process or at least thinking or yeah i think they've actually put down some money they're trying to buy mgm (laughs) the film studio because yeah mgm has been in financial troubles for quite some time there all there, there have been rumors before that someone might snap them up and yeah it seems to me that amazon just yeah wants a movie studio at this point and you probably don't want mgm for the name but you want them for their library because as yeah. far as i know i think james bond is still part of mgm i think so yes yeah so don't know what's going to happen with that, but it's definitely something yeah that could develop in an interesting way. Not sure if it's a good good thing, not sure if it's a bad thing, but it's yeah, there's definitely something happening in the movie business. Maybe because of the pandemic, maybe it would have happened anyway, I don't know, but there seems to be some shake up in the movie business. Yeah, there's some strange things happening. Yeah, strange things are afoot. <laughs> okay, let's move on to check this out. So what do you have for us this week? Oh, this week I have something very small. It's a game. It's called Record of Lotus War, Deedle it in Wonder Labyrinth. First of all, Record of Lotus War, for those who don't know it... Like me... Like you, <laughs> Record of Lotus War is uh, a series of books uh, about sort of role playing, sort of Dungeons and Dragons in Japanese, I would say. And probably most people know the anime from the early 90s. I think it's 1990. Uh, I really loved that back then. And it's it's a very traditional fantasy story that's heavily inspired by Dungeons and Dragons and uh, it works pretty well. And there is um, an elf there uh, called Didlit. She is kind of the first, she's kind of the only female protagonist of the group and, and there a lot of stuff happens. At the end, she gets together with the actual hero of the story and that elf got her own game. And the game is a Metroidvania. And I mean, a Metroidvania is a game style I really, really love. Uh, and I usually, if someone makes one, I try that. I try that. I play that a little bit. And it's really, really heavily inspired by Castlevania Symphony of the Night, the PlayStation 1 game. In fact, it's so much inspired. I would even say they ripped off some of the graphics from there. Uh, I don't want to accuse anyone, but 
there's some tiles and, and animations, they look really, really like a Symphony of the Night. And I mean, why not? Alucard was a very girly character and it kind of fits that now we have a female elf, elf playing with his animation cycles. And it's actually pretty good. It's it's a really great Metroidvania. It's not all that long. It I I think you get through it in I would say four or maybe five hours. But there is no padding. It's just a, a, a very it's just great gameplay and I like that. And I'm always happy if a game doesn't overstay its welcome. So it's a recommendation. Right now, it's only available for PC on Steam, but there will be a Switch release in July, I think. So if you don't have a PC, uh, keep your eyes open for the Switch release. I think it's a game that is a lot of fun. So go and buy it. Okay, thanks for that. Obviously, I'm familiar with Castlevania. I know what a Metroidvania is. I've played Metroidvanias before, but I've never heard of the record of Lotus War. <laughs> <laughs> never in my life. Well, the anime is great, too. You really should watch it. Okay, maybe. M- maybe after Gargoyles. <laughs> yeah, finish that first. Or at least the first two uh, seasons of Gargoyles. How about you? I have a game as well. Well, actually, three games. I've never played Mass Effect. So when Mass Effect Legendary Edition was released this week, I decided to yeah get it. And I've started playing Mass Effect 1. I kept playing Mass Effect 1. I finished Mass Effect 1. And I started with Mass Effect 2. And I really enjoy my time with Mass Effect so far. The story is pretty good. Gameplay, you realize that these games, yeah, are... Yeah, they're they're a few years old. You notice that. But they, yeah, changed up some graphics. They made them a little bit smoother. The... And that's something even I know, even though I did not play them back in the day, the elevator rides are way, way shorter. (laughs) But I have to admit, I really missed out on something, I think. The, as I said, the gameplay is pretty cool, but I think you play Mass Effect for the story and for the characters. And it's, it's, it's one of those things where you can only take three people on a mission or two other people on a mission, and you actually have a hard time deciding who to bring because actually you want to spend some time with most of them. So I I really like uh, when a game does that. I also like the fact that you have to, or that you can either play as a good guy or as kind of a bad guy, that you can play Paragon or Renegade. And yeah, obviously I played Paragon so far. So the, the the plan is actually to to finish the game as as, as Paragon and then maybe a second playthrough as as Renegade. One thing I really like so far about the Legendary Edition is that when you start with Mass Effect One, you can actually take your character from the first one with all the decisions you made and just keep playing in two. That's pretty cool. So yeah. Uh, long story short, I'm really enjoying Mass Effect and I'm very happy that I've yeah finally played it. I'm happy you finally play Mass Effect. And I, I think now is the perfect time to play or replay Mass Effect with the Legendary Edition. I mean, the Mass Effect games, they were always great, even though... I mean, you might have heard that not all people were happy with the ending of the third one. This is, uh, I think everybody knows. Uh, I wonder if they will change it again in the Legendary Edition. Um, Yeah, but anyway, uh, Mass Effect, these are games that are really worth playing. So good choice, Greg. Yeah, 
I'll keep you updated on my progress through Mass Effect. Personally, I like the second most. Probably going to play some more after we finish today's recording. <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah. <sighs> okay, so let's move on to our main story, to our story of the week. This week, we try to do yeah something we haven't done before again. We're always trying to break new grounds here on Passion of the Geeks. That's true. So usually we talk about things that we both are knowledgeable in. Indeed. But today we decided to talk about something that the other one is not an expert in. To be more precise, today we decided to recommend some books to each other and obviously to our audience. So each of us, uh, we chose a book or book series uh, that is very, very dear to us, uh, that we like very much. And maybe we would like the other one to have a glimpse of or maybe even read. And we thought we could yeah, build an episode around it, talk a little bit about the book, why we like it, and why we think other people might enjoy it. Does that sound like a plan, Pat? That sounds exactly like what we're trying to do here, yes. So I'm the host today, so I think it's fair that you go first. Oh, yeah. You brought us something very, very interesting today. So, yeah, enlighten me. <laughs> yeah, indeed. I uh, honestly, I had thought about talking about this book or this uh, short book series. It's two books. Uh, and I wanted to talk about them first in our one of our unplugged episodes because I know you haven't read those books, and I really wanted you and the world to know how great they are. And of course, this is always a very personal opinion. But if someone would ask me what my favorite book would be, um. I mean, it's it's always hard to make one favorite, to choose one favorite. But certainly one of the first books that we come to mind is Ilium by Dan Simmons. And actually it's the 2003 Ilium and then the 2005 Olympus. It's a duology, so they belong together. You cannot... Uh, read them out of order they don't make sense then this this is one story which might be off-putting to some well dan simmons is an author that is actually more known for his horror thingies that he writes if i'm not mistaken i Myself learned about Dan Simmons when I've read his science fiction uh, story, Hyperion. There are four books in this um, Hyperion Cantos. It was such a great book. And I immediately fell in love with how the Dan Simmons writes. And when Ilium uh, was released... I had to read it and I was hooked from the very beginning. To summarize, the book is actually not that easy uh, because it starts with the Trojan War <laughs> and it rages at the foot of Olympus Mons on Mars. <laughs> and it's actually observed and, and influenced by... Uh, Zeus and the other Greek gods and they all exist and everything is observed by a Homeric scholar a so-called scholic called Thomas Hockenberry and it's basically through his eyes where we start to get into the story uh, he is a uh, 20th century or 21st century teacher who was actually uh, who was teaching Homer's uh, Iliad in university and he's resurrected to learn about the uh, Trojan War 
it's very, very strange. <laughs> Especially because they're not on Earth. Because on Earth, the story centers on a small group of humans that just live there. Uh, they're sort of far into the future. They don't have any care in the world. They are cared for. Uh, they cannot get sick. They cannot... Well... They can die. They, they just have a lifespan of a hundred years where they, instead of traveling through the world, they use fax machines and they fax from one node to the other. And it sounds uh, seriously strange. And when they turn hundred, they make their final fax where they fax themselves into the clouds and join the post humans in the orbital rings of the Earth. <laughs> but this is not the strangest part of the story. So we have <laughs> humans in the far future. We have the Trojan War. We have Greek gods that actually use quantum technology to influence everything. We, <laughs> we, we have a 21st century Homeric scholar. And we do have sentient biomechanics robots called Moravex that actually live on the moons of Jupiter. <laughs> and they detect that on, on Mars there is a lot of quantum fluctuation going on and they kind of are afraid that this might rip open the solar system or maybe even the universe. And so they send uh, a couple of these Moravex to Mars to look to see what's going on. And this is where we we meet some other characters that they that we actually have as protagonists. One of them is Manmut, and Moravec from Europa, who is a fan of Shakespeare, <laughs> and his friend Orfu of the of Io, who is actually a fan of Proust. <laughs> and this sounds really really strange. And the thing is. Everything comes together and makes perfect sense. <laughs> and there are so many more like little green men on Mars and, and Prospero from Shakespeare's The Tempest ruling as a mage over Earth and battling with Setebos. It's, it's a blast. <laughs> it's a real... Do you follow the story so far, Greg? Well, thank God we have an audio podcast because my face was doing strange things during the last <laughs> few minutes. It sounds interesting, but really, really, really weird, which is obviously, it's it's not a bad thing. So <laughs> the, the, the way I understood it so far is that there are, obviously multiple story threads yeah that's at, at least the way uh the way you describe them seem to be vaguely influenced by yeah human history that's true or maybe not human history maybe human art in a way exactly you got that correct because yeah, the, the moment you have someone like Prospero and the Olympic gods and robots in the same story, it seemed to me like we're drawing from different source material. Yeah, and that's actually the major theme of the book or the story is um, that art is the heart and the soul of what makes us humans. And it's a very powerful story about that. It's, if, if you don't have art, if you don't have stories, if you, if you don't even have history, what made us, we succumb to a stoic non-existence like the, the few humans that are left on earth. They have nothing. And only... When one of of the humans called Harmon uh, actually is very close to his hundredth birthday and very close to his final facts, he actually starts to 
to question what will happen, who are we, and those those humans can't even read. They they cannot do anything, and they don't have any need for it. They just exist. And uh, the strange thing about that is they are cared for by, again, some sort of biomechanical machines called Voinex. And I mean, it's pretty clear that, and I, I think that this much I can spoil is at one point, these old style humans on earth they will change because this is what the book is about. And once they change, they are no longer cared for by these Voynichs and they are hunted and killed and everything turns. It's it's also a little bit, I think, the way that people get thrown out the Garden Eden, you know, in the, in the Bible. It's, it's It has a little bit of that as well. Um, but the way it uh, Dan Simmons uh, uh, uses the story in its epicness to to tell us what we are in our core, what it means to be human, it's wonderful. Plus, it's it's <laughs> it's in this package, you know, with, with the primitive humans of the future, the Greek gods, the the warriors of the Trojan War, a beautiful Helen of Troy, <laughs> and uh, the biomechanical robots from Jupiter, and, and and everything that just fits together. Because these robots, they are in its its core. They are more human than the beings that are left on Earth. It's a fantastic story. I just try to wrap you know, my brain around something. And if it's too much of a spoiler or if I'm totally embarrassing myself, I'm going to cut this out. But it seems to me the way you describe the people on Earth, they are yeah, with the whole faxing and ending up mm-hmm. in the cloud. To me, and I've, yeah, I, I'm hearing about this for the first time today. To me, it sounds like a commentary about our current society that is too occupied with their little mobile devices in their pockets and is only interested in yeah in technology and what technology can do and not interested in in the stories anymore mhm that that's a good point and actually you you are right uh, to a certain degree and you know it turns out that and i don't think i go too far it turns out that the Greek gods are actually are actually humans as well. It's it, they're just in another state of evolution because there's a little bit of time travel involved too, <laughs> to make it a little more complex. As if the story wasn't complex enough, and the Greek gods they're actually, you know, they have all that technology, but they have lost what they are because. They haven't, uh, with with all their toys and everything, they have lost the way to make art. So they look for culture in Homer's Iliad because it's it's one of the oldest stories that we actually know about. So that's certainly one of the things that, that goes in that direction. Okay, yeah. So you're totally right. I have a degree in English literature. I mean, come on. <laughs> yes, and that is why I think you need to read it because it, there is a lot of Shakespeare in that, a lot of prowess in that. There um, is a lot of Homer, of course. And the thing is, uh, Dan Simmons actually does a great job in retelling the Iliad up to the point where it falls apart, of course, but it's it's very close to the finale. So, um, and in a more, I would say, chronological way than uh, Homer has done it. Um, 
if I remember correctly. And one of the things also that Dan Simmons tries to to show us is how each generation has a different way to tell stories and how a same old story can still be retold for a new audience, for a new generation, and still be as engaging and as as uh, important as, as it was ever before. But, you know, I've tried to come down to some very few elements that the story, uh, very few story threats that are important. And you can already see it's a complex story. And the way it is told is Dan Simmons tells it strictly through the eyes of his protagonists. So if we uh, experience the story through the eyes of Harmon from uh, as an old style human, things that he takes for granted will not be explained to the to, to the reader, to the audience. So what you need to be ready to do is piece the information together as much as you can. And then once the different groups merge, there's a lot of information uh, sharing between each group. And then a lot of, of, of things make more sense or explained then. But you need to be patient. If, if, if you cannot read a story uh, that doesn't explain what's actually happening in the next chapter or, or something, uh, you will be very, very unhappy reading it. So this might be a caveat at Dan Simmons' style of storytelling, but it makes it very, very interesting to read it for the first time when you are discovering the world. And in my opinion, it makes it even more interesting to read it a second time when you actually know how everything is connected and you get a deeper meaning from the scenes that he describes. And that's fantastic. But it's a pretty long story. Uh, as I said, there are two books. Yeah, that would have been my next question. I, <laughs> I hope this is just 300 pages each. Yeah, n not exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, in its soft cover incarnation, uh, Ilium has 752 pages <laughs> and Olympus has 851 pages. So it's 1,603 pages. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Short. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's a very epic story, but it's, it's a page turner in the mm. best sense of the world. It's really engaging. So, yeah, I mean, it takes a while. But uh, it's one of the few books that I have actually read more than twice. There are a lot of books I have read twice. But more than twice, uh, not that many, because uh, there are so many other books waiting for me to read. So I usually, <laughs> uh, I think twice is enough. But Ilium, I have read Ilium three times and I actually plan to read it this year again when I'm on vacation. It's just that good. I know it's not everyone's cup of tea. I know that. Uh, you have to be prepared to, to get into it. Mm -hmm. But what do you think? Would it be a story that you would be interested in hearing? It's a shame that we don't have a video podcast because during the first part of your introduction into Ilium and Olympus, I think I made some really strange faces. <laughs> but you, you've seen it because we were looking at each other. During the second <laughs> yeah. part, I started to nod a lot. Yeah. And <laughs> that's actually a good sign. Because when I start nodding... Yeah, the wheels in my brain, they're turning. And yes, I have little cog wheels in there. Uh, they're <laughs> turning and things start to make sense. And I I'm going to admit it for the first five minutes of your talk. 
and barely anything was making sense. It seemed to me like a, this sounds like Ready Player One with Greek mythology and someone <laughs> on drugs. <laughs> but the, the second part and the, the way you, 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 yeah, the way you put it together, or uh, the way that Dan Simmons uh, puts it together, seems to me that it's parts of it kind of remind me not in style or in content, but in, in spirit with Cloud Atlas. Mm-hmm. Good, good comparison, though. Yeah. And that's definitely something that I'm very much interested in. And yeah. All, all the ingredients of this story that you mentioned are actually very intriguing. And I argue that I like things that require some effort to get into think good art or good food or pretty much anything that is really good is acquired taste the mm. more and it's not not the more you need to work for it but the more you need to give it the more i like it because the real enjoyment of something is not just consummation you need to work for it so yeah. I have to admit, the more you talk about it, the more up my alley this sounds. Great, great. I'm, I'm really happy. I could kindle a little bit of uh, interest in that. Pat is glowing yeah. right now. He's glowing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I don't want to spoil more of it. Um, I hope I haven't spoiled too much. I suggest we go over to your book. What do you think? We're already way, way, way too long again, but that's oh. something that's something that always happens. But <laughs> yeah, I think I'll I'll take over. So, uh, Ilium yeah. and Olympus. Maybe I mention it in the future. I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe. Fingers crossed. So, I'm going to start by saying something that occurred to me that. On one hand, it's surprising, but on the other hand, it actually isn't. Our two stories or our two books that we're presenting today couldn't be more different. Because first of all, mine is only 255 pages long. Oh, good. <laughs> and there are very different in scope, very different in what kind of story is told. But I actually think there are about very similar themes, very similar ideas. I'm going to talk to you about uh, Neil Gaiman's The Ocean at the End of the Lane, a book that came out in 2013. It's one of my favorite books. Another of my favorite books is The Neverending Story. And when I'm finished with my little talk, I think people will realize why. And yeah, for those uh, of you who have never uh, heard of Neil Gaiman, which I presume is not that many people in a podcast that is about geeks. Neil Gaiman, writer of lots of stories that uh, geeks know, maybe most famous for American Gods or together with Terry Pratchett for Good Omens. He's one of my favorite writers, and not just because I like the stories he writes, I also like his prose. And uh, The Ocean at the End of the Lane is no exception there. A uh, quick summary. So the story is set in Sussex, England. A middle-aged man, so yeah, about our age, Pat, uh, returns to his childhood home to attend a funeral. The man doesn't have a name, so it's easy for, for us to... Yeah, put ourselves in his shoes. And his house or the house he used to live is not there anymore. It's long gone. But he's drawn to the farm at the end of the road. And when he's there at the farm, he starts to remember that he was friends with the girl of that farm, a girl called Letty Hamstock. And he met her mother and grandmother there and so on, so on. So he goes back to that farm and her mother and grandmother... They're still there. He hasn't thought of Letty in a very, very long time, in decades, actually. And as he starts talking to them, as he sits or as, he, as he's close to the pond at the end of the lane that for Letty always was an ocean, he starts to remember his childhood. 
He starts to remember how he met Letty, the adventures they had, and yeah, the more the more he remembers, the more is the more of his unremembered past, so to speak, comes back, comes actually flooding back. And the past that he starts to remember is very strange, very frightening. There are dangerous situations there. And it's, how should I put it? We don't know whether or not this is actually something that really happened to him or whether it's just the imagination of a small boy. But... It doesn't matter. So basically what happened in the story that he remembers is that there was a horrifying death that started a chain of events that unleashed a darkness from another dimension. And it's up to him, his, yeah, his 11-year-old self, or yeah, I think he's 11 or maybe even younger, and Letty to deal with it. And it's such an interesting story because... On one hand, you don't know whether it's just a boy who about a boy who had a hard time making friends and had to go through some family troubles, or if it's actually a story about the boy who fought some demons, fought some monsters, or whatever. And the thing is, it's actually not that important because it's, and maybe I'm saying too far already, it's about how you decide to remember your childhood and maybe i'm i was exactly the right age when i read it this book when it came out but it reminded me that yeah in during your childhood everything is an adventure and when you look back at your childhood yeah you just crossed the road and to me this book is exactly about that it's who you were as a child the disconnect between your childhood and your adulthood. And there, there is a, a really nice quote about this that, that sums this up uh, very beautifully. And I, I'm going to read it because, yeah, it's Neil Gaiman and his prose is just wonderful. Childhood memories are sometimes covered and obscured beneath the things that come later. Like childhood toys forgotten at the bottom of a cramped adult closet but they are never lost for good. And I think this sums up what I think childhood is perfectly. It's, yeah, it, it's something that is part of us, whether we remember it or not. But when we remember it, I hope we remember it as a, and as, as an adventure story and not as a yeah tragic drama or whatever. And by employing magical realism, it's so great how he manages to, yeah, did this really happen or didn't it? Is it just, is it just this boy being sad that his fam his mother and his dad are going through a bad time and that his father probably has an affair with the nanny? Or is the nanny actually actually an interdimensional monster? And I'm making it sound ridiculous, but the way it's written, it's very beautiful. It's sometimes all, of even haunting, and it's just a great read. I've actually read it with students a couple of time, times okay. because 255 pages is is a good read uh, for a class, and. There are a lot of interesting things to talk about because it focuses beyond the family life of, of this boy. And the connection I make to, or the connection I was trying to make to Ilium and Olympus, whereas Ilium and, Ilium and Olympus tell a very epic story, or at least the way you describe it, mm. this is a very personal story. But the reason they're important to be told is pretty much the same. Because it tells us who we were, who we are, and maybe even where we're going. And at least to me, that seems something that, yeah, art, good art, good books, good TV shows, good movies, good music, good video games and everything is actually for. So, yeah, it tells us why imagination matters. What truth is. That's... Yeah, that 
the art that a book like this can capture the magic of your childhood and that things can be beautiful and scary at the same time and that's something I, I really, really like. And just, um, yeah, I, I love his prose. Just to give you another quote, and th this is the last one. I'm, I'm going to stop after this. <sighs> grown-ups don't look like grown-ups on the inside either. Outside, they're big and thoughtless, and they always know what they're doing. Inside, they look just like they always have, like they did when they were your age. Truth is, there aren't any grown-ups, not one, in the whole wide world. And I just love this because to to me this is just yeah this this is this is true. I'm not a grown up. I don't I don't feel my age. Sorry. And I don't know anyone else does. <laughs> <laughs> the 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 truth is um <laughs> maybe we as geeks are even a little less grown ups than others who try to be grown-ups. <laughs> but the thing is, I have to confess, well, first, uh, I actually like Neil Gaiman. I've, I've read a couple of things and um, I haven't read The Ocean at the End of the Lane. Uh, the, the thing is that <clears throat> that last quote uh, touches me a lot because it's something similar than what I just recently said to my son. Because, I mean, this this is, yeah, I see it a little bit from the perspective, from the point of view of a, an, a parent, uh, while you see it from the point of view as a teacher. And... Um, I think this is a, a book I really, really need to to read, and then maybe we must we we should do a follow up on on how our different adult point of views uh, let us view that book because it's something that I, it, it gripped me immediately. I don't feel like an adult most of the time because uh, I have that, that sort of that idea that an adult usually knows what he does, <laughs> that he has a plan <laughs> or something. And, and I don't have a plan. <laughs> I'm just making it up as I go. <laughs> and, yeah. And, I, I and, think we, we don't need to tell anyone who's listening today or to any of our episodes that we're adults. I mean, just today <laughs> we talked about the Bad Batch gargoyles, DuckTales, <laughs> Masters of the Universe, and so on. I think that ship has sailed with our audience, <laughs> definitely. But to all the geeks out there, if you are parents as well, you are the best of the parents because you are a child at heart and you state that child and that's a great thing that is something a lot of adults just try to ignore that they are still children inside so um yeah greg i i actually really look forward to read that book it's definitely worth it and it's just 250 pages yeah i i can do that <laughs> And yeah, maybe I should just uh, quickly because I I, I, I talked about uh, the never ending story a little bit in the beginning, and mm. I maybe those of you, uh, those of our listeners and you definitely do those who know or are familiar with the never ending story. It's in a way it's similar because the never ending mm. story is also about how telling a story can lead to a truth about yourself and. This to me is yeah very very similar. So I, I seem to be drawn to stories that are about storytelling. Yeah, and, and just to clarify very quickly, uh, when Greg talks about the never-ending story, he talks about the book. If if you just know the movie, it's just I think half of the book or something. I have to admit, though, I really love the first movie. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. No, yes, of course. Nothing That's against the first movie. never ending, but yeah, the yeah. book is really, really good. And I have to admit though, I I like the first half of the book more than the second half. Mm, I agree. 
Yeah. I agree. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's something we 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 have. Maybe that's a book we could talk about at one point as well. Oh, yeah, or that, that maybe maybe Michael Ende. I think is definitely an author mm-hmm. that we could tackle at some point because he had some some very cool books. I've I think I've read all of his books. Honestly, yeah, I've, I think I've read all of them. Yeah, he was my favorite too. author as a kid. But yeah, I'm talking about the Enough. ocean at the end of the lane, <laughs> which I would definitely recommend. And just one additional fact: when I when I read books with my with my students, they they don't like all the books because let's be honest, they're assigned reading, and yeah, we all know how that goes. But yeah, I. I think, and maybe if some of my students are listening, maybe they can can complain in the comments or something. That <laughs> most of the books I choose, they actually, or at least some of them, enjoy. Obviously, if you have a class of twenty people, if you have a book that everyone likes, there's something wrong with the book. <laughs> but if you have a book that no one likes, maybe there's something wrong as well. Yeah. So. <laughs> I, I would argue that the ocean of the end of the lane is definitely some it's definitely the book that a lot of them really really enjoy, even though they're they're not where we are yet. I always tell them if you don't get this, this book is yours. Maybe you reread it in fifteen to twenty years, you're gonna get something new out of it. And yeah, I've haven't met anyone who who reread it because yeah book came out in 2013 so it's, we're not there yet but well let's see maybe maybe a student comes up to me in the future and says oh i reread it it's so good <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be wonderful that would be wonderful yeah 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 that would be great <laughs> yeah i mean this is all i have to say about it because it's really something that you need to experience yourself Mm. And so it's like the matrix <laughs> <laughs> in I'm a sorry. way in a way in a way <laughs> that's uh, honestly it's it's a wonderful book that i yeah that i would recommend to pretty much everyone yeah and uh i i'm totally interested in it so great choice bringing that to this episode yeah. Thank you. And it didn't take me as long to talk about it as it did you. But I mean, when we compare pages, I think I talked longer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I confess, uh, I had to decide how do I put all the relevant things I want to tell about the story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to edit that one down a little bit. <laughs> no, no, just kidding, <laughs> just kidding. Okay, do you have anything else you want to add about the ocean at the end of the lane or about Helium and Olympus? Just that the ocean at the end of the lane is an excellent title. Uh, so, um, I mean, from all the meaning that is in that title alone, excellent. Uh, so that's it <laughs> uh, just just one thing i i forgot to mention uh there are actually th- there have been talks about doing a movie adaptation of the book for yeah basically since it came out and never so- something never came of it and maybe it's in development development hell and honestly i think it's kind of i think it's very difficult to adapt something like this kind of the magical realism i Mm. Yeah, I don't know how they could do it justice, but and I think that's something that developed maybe out of the troubles they had adapting it as a movie. There is actually a play based on the ocean at the end of the lane that's on in London, and mm. it's one of those things that's on my list. If that whole pandemic thing is over and I get tickets and I have a long weekend to go to London. I actually have the plan to watch the play The Ocean at the End of the Lane because I think that a play is the perfect way to translate this to another medium. Yeah, that could work. That could because totally kind of work. The whole idea of magical realism, <clears throat> in my head, it works so much better on stage than it does in the movie. Mm-hmm. And I'm just dying to find out if I'm right. 
Yeah. So maybe I um, include the trailer to the stage show into the show notes because it looks really, really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe I can accompany you. We'll see what will happen. That, that'd be a cool trip, actually. That'd be pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. would be. <laughs> that's cool. Kind of a long weekend in London, some West End shows. Yeah, that, that sounds like a, the first official Passion of the Geeks road trip. <laughs> <laughs> we shall make it so. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, on that note, this is it for this week. Please like, share, and subscribe to our podcast. We're on all major podcasting services and on YouTube. And you can find us on www.passionofthegeeks.com. You can send in suggestions and questions to passionofthegeeks at gmail.com. And you can find us on Twitter at passionotgeeks. Pat, as always, it was a pleasure. And I either go and play some more... Mass Effect, or maybe I'm just gonna buy and order that Helium book. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it, it was a lot of fun to do this, Greg, and an excellent idea. So, um, yeah, and I probably just hit the sack. <laughs> so, <laughs> take care, Greg. Yeah, take care, pet. The piranhas said nothing, but they threshed about in their bowl ominously. <laughs>